All right, so before we go ahead and start analyzing our data, I first want to talk a little bit about the theory behind EEG connectivity so that you get a more intuitive sense of what we mean when we say that there was connectivity between two EEG sensors. So first, essentially, when we want to say that there is connectivity, what we mean is that the signals that were recorded from two areas tended to show a relationship with one another that was greater than we might have expected based on chance. So the way that we're going to quantify that dependency between signals is by using the phase lag index. And we're going to use across trials, which means that uh, we're going to look at how consistent uh, two signals tended to be with one another, whether they were in sync or not. We're going to take that measure and we're going to average it across all of our trials so that we see during this one time of our event, did these two areas tend to be involved in the same process or not? And that's going to be our measure of connectivity. So first, as I mentioned, we're gonna to wanna to be able to describe the relationship between the signals recorded at two sensors. Once we have that relationship described, then we can look at how consistent it was across all of our trials, and then we can quantify that consistency. So here, I've kind of showed two signals being recorded from electrodes. So this black signal might have been from FPZ, this green one could have been from PZ, and this is just the voltage over time. So what we wanna do first is look at one time point so I've described here this one time, um, and we're gonna wanna understand what the relationship between our signals was at this uh, instantaneous point. So what we're gonna do is take the instantaneous phase, so the point in the cycle that this signal is at for each of these and just relate it to one another. We're just gonna take the difference. So the instantaneous phase of the signal from FPZ at this time point subtracted from the instantaneous phase of the signal uh, of PZ at this time point. So we're going to take that difference, and this is just going to be a way to describe the relationship between our two sensors. What was the difference between their phases? Um, okay, so if maybe one, uh, if the, the difference is negative, then we can say that one is leading, whereas if the difference is positive, then we can say that one is lagging. So this kind of describes the relationship between these two signals that we're recording. Now, intuitively, if you want to understand across all of our trials, how consistent was that phase difference, then you would just take the differences at each trial and then take the average. And that's exactly right, but there's kind of one caveat. Um, unlike an ERP, where we can just average across all the trials, these phase values, the instantaneous phase that we're working with, can't quite be averaged across in the same way. And that's because it's not uh, representing a, a number on a number line in the same sense where the, the average would have kind of a meaningful result, but instead we can think of it as representing the angle of a cycle. So if we have this cycle here where some point is going around in a circle, then the phase of this oscillation that's represented by this circle would be right here. And so instead of a number on a number line, it would represent a point on a circle. And so because of that, we need a little bit more uh, complicated math in order to be able to work with the averages of these phases. So what we're gonna do in order to represent a signal on this uh, plane right here so that we can use it in our calculations is we're gonna use um, Euler's function. And so this takes E, the natural log, and puts it to the power of I, the imaginary number, times your phase at some time point, so just a phase, and that's going to give us a complex value here with a real part and an imaginary part on this circle. And we're going to do that for both, and this is just going to give us two complex values representing the signal recorded at this time point from FPZ and PZ. And you'll see this is kind of an important um, function in that it can provide us with this way of comparing phases. Um, and you're gonna see it come up again in the actual phase lag index calculation. So just to reiterate, we now have this way of taking a signal and representing its phase on this unit circle in the complex plane here. So once we have both of those signals from two electrodes uh, represented like that, then what we're really interested in is the difference. So what we're going to do is take that difference, and now we're going to represent that difference as a, a vector on this complex plane here, so we can work with its phase. And in the equation for PLI, which we'll go over right here, um, and it's actually, it looks quite complicated, but you'll even see right now we can do this just mentally. Um, so what we're going to do is take that function that I just talked about, e to the i something, and we're going to take the phase difference. So the phase of sensor J subtracted from the phase of sensor K. If you think about the previous example, this would be the phase of the signal recorded at FPZ, and this would be the phase of the signal recorded at PZ, and this would all be for one time point. All right, so we're gonna do that function, 
e to the i of our phase difference for every one of our trials. So one, two, n, all of our trials. And that's going to give us this distribution of phase lags right here. So you can see that each of these vectors is a trial. And in some of our trials, channel FPZ was lagging. And in some other of our trials, channel FPZ was leading. So now we want to say, OK, how consistent was that relationship? Did it always lag? Did it always lead? Or was it relatively random? Um, and so what we do to these values here for each of these individual trials is apply these two functions here. So first off, we take the imaginary component, IM. Um, and this, rather than having this value, which is a complex number, which has both a real and an imaginary part, rather than having this complex value, we're only interested with the imaginary component. So we're just going to take the y value of that vector. And then here, we're going to take the y value of that vector. This one would be here. So now we just have points uh, rather than all these vectors. And then we're going to apply this signum function to each of those points. And that's just going to uh, tell us what the sign is. So if this is a positive value, the signum function is going to return a positive one. And if it's a negative value, the signum function is going to return a negative one. So then what we end up having for this entire term here is each of our trials now has a positive one or a negative one. And now all we're going to do is sum up all of those values uh, and take the mean. So this is going to involve 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, so 7 ones, uh, and then minus 3. So all of this is just going to be 7 minus 3. So this is going to be 4. And the final step, uh, and then we're going to take the average, I guess. So 4 over our 10 trials. So that would be 0.4. And the final thing is to take the absolute value. So you can see here that we got a positive value because we had more trials where, let's say, channel FPZ was leading. But we could have just as easily had it where this channel was lagging. And then we would have lots of trials down in this quadrant here. And we want PLI to uh, tell us the same value because we're only interested in how consistent it was, not the, the direction. And so we just take the absolute value. And so again, this means that the, the phase lag index for channel J and K, if it was represented by uh, this set of phase lags, would be 0.4. All right, so what are the advantages of using the phase lag index? There's a couple. There's one primary one. And if you think about what that equation is getting at, how consistent the difference between our phases was across all of these trials at a certain time point, then we can now look, OK, well, when is it high and when is it zero? Now, phase lag index is going to be zero when there's an equal proportion of phase lags uh, compared to phase leads, I guess. So you can see here there were five trials in which one signal was leading, five trials in which it was lagging. And because that averages around zero, then we say that there wasn't a consistent uh, phase lag. And so the convenient aspect of this is that when we have a, a distribution of phase lags that looks like this, then it, it might be saying that the, um, the two signals were perfectly synchronized with one another. Or if it was maybe on this side right here, then the two signals were perfectly out of sync with one another. And if we think about what we're recording in the brain, when we have two signals that are perfectly in sync with one another, it could be pure synchronization, which does occur, but it could also be uh, volume conduction. It could be that there was one single source that was oscillating and the signal happened to be picked up through volume conduction at two different sensors. And now we're actually measuring the same signal, but we're saying that, oh, these two signals are perfectly synchronized. And since we don't want to have volume conduction as an artifact in our connectivity measures, then what we do is just we attenuate it. We remove any pure synchronization where the, the phase lags center around zero. Um, here, you can see what a perfect phase lag index, which has a value of 1, looks like. And this means that all of our phase lags had the same sign. So this means that across every one of our trials at this time point, channel FPZ was always leading channel PZ. And therefore, we can say that they, there's a statistical dependency between those two signals, and therefore they show connectivity. Uh, here is just an example of the value somewhere between those two, which is obviously what you'll get the vast majority of the time. And it's just showing, this is what we used in the last calculation, that we can quantify how consistent those phase lags are across all of our trials. So once we've done this between every pair of sensors at every time point, which is what we're going to need to do, then we're going to be left with, with what's called an adjacency matrix at each time point. 
uh, for each frequency band, essentially. We've only looked at the signals in one frequency band in this video, but uh, this can be applied to all frequency bands. So what we're going to be left with for each time point is an adjacency matrix that shows us each sensor, the relationship, the connectivity that it shows with every other sensor. So you can see here that the values within this matrix are our PLI values. So the yellow is a 0.8. That was quite consistent. Uh, the zero was not consistent. Um, and you can just see that for every sensor, we can go and check what the connectivity was between every other sensor. So sensor 120 showed a PLI of 0.3 or something like that. And because the connectivity between two sensors is undirected, the that is the connectivity that channel 10 showed with channel 20 is the same that channel 20 showed with 10. This is a symmetrical matrix. Um, all right, so that's kind of the theory and the way to calculate PLI. So in some future videos, we'll be going over how you can actually analyze this uh, in MATLAB.